Hey everybody, what's going on? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching the sit down, doing it from home, quarantine because of coronavirus, but that doesn't stop what we're doing. Ari Hursty's here with us. He's a cybersecurity expert. Brand new documentary coming out, Kill Chain, the cyber attack on America's elections. Ari, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. I'm self quarantined I'm not quarantined, so so far so good. <laughs> yeah, and certainly a lot to talk about these days when it comes to public health, and certainly a lot to talk about with the 2020 election. So it's a couple months away, and I thought it was pretty cool that you guys went all around the country, all around the world, to talk to a bunch of different people about voting machines, the election process, hacking. What was the most fascinating thing that you guys learned? Well, first of all, uh, we started uh, this movie over three years ago, and this is a follow-up for a movie, uh, uh, Hacking Democracy, from 2006. So th this has been basically for me ongoing since 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, so there have been a lot of things, and, and one of the reasons why we started uh, the voting machine hacking village at DEF CON was because everything is so unbelievable. If somebody would try to explain me everything I have learned during this almost 15 years, I wouldn't believe it. Right. I absolutely couldn't believe it. At the, at the time when I was asked first time to file to hack voting machines, and people were explaining me, uh, because I was retired, I had sold my businesses, I was like, uh, fine, fine I'm, I'm, I'm done. Uh, when people tried to explain what is wrong, I absolutely couldn't believe it. I, I told them, well, sorry, uh, this is something, your story cannot be true. There's something wrong. I, I'm certain you believe it, but I won't. And, and so I, I, I refused to do it for over a year. And until I, 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 my conditions were met, uh, which was uh, the conditions were set only that I don't need to do it and people go away. But still today, uh, that's why we are trying to educate, help people to learn the truth in, in because Def Con Voting Village is really about education. It's about people being able to learn the truth themselves. So everything is so incredible. And, and there's so many sad, horrible stories uh, which are not because people are bad. It's because people don't have the skills, education, resources needed. So when you think about when you guys were doing Hacking Democracy in the mid-2000s to where you guys are at now, what's the most frightening thing in terms of just the ability for people to hack into our election system? Uh, I think the, the problem, the most, most frightening thing is, first of all, from 2006 to now is nothing changed. Uh, the actual same version of software I had 2005 is still in use. It's, those machines are still in 20 states, mm. um, so they're still around. Uh, even the so-called new sold today is in the end of life version of, of Windows, etc. Like just something which in no other industry would be acceptable, not even remotely acceptable. Uh, so I think the most, as overall, it is how outdated everything is and, and how hard it is to make people to understand the, the reality and, and get the warning through that this needs to be fixed or things will get really, really worse, uh, turn to worse. If they're bad right now, but, and I cannot even cannot imagine what the worst would be looking like. Um, but I would say that the overall, what is wrong is two things. First of all, the threat model is wrong. Uh, we, in the United States, the threat model was a dishonest candidate who was trying to win, or the support group of the dishonest candidate. It never took into account things like nation state, as things like disruptors who don't actually, they might have a preferred candidate, but the primary, uh, in, in the, the primary reason is just to sow discord, distrust, undermine the system, undermine the democracy. And, and all the other kinds of actors, threat actors and their motivations, which are not selfish, because the, the, the US threat model was only about self-interest and self-promotion, and actually only about the top of the ballot, not about the billions of dollars of bond issues and whatnot, which are laying down in the ballot. Mm -hmm. so, so that is the one thing which is wrong. The second thing is we think that there is an election office, and the election office has an IT department and the IT department has security people. That's absolutely wrong. Normal election department doesn't have even a one full-time IT person, zero security people, not, a, not, a, not even, everything is outsourced. And when we look how much new technology has been pouring in the election environment during the last 20 years, what it should be, 
there should be an IT department which happens to do elections, not the other way around. It is just a, 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 a situation where because of outsourcing, because of lack of resources, it's completely upside down. If there would be a foreign military making a land invasion to US soil, yeah. you wouldn't ask the local sheriff to defend the land, but that's exactly what happens in this area. Election security is a national security matter. And you are asking a local election official who has no training, who has no resources to defend the whole land, potentially against a foreign invader. So that's a very asymmetric, very unfair situation. Yeah, I think you hit on the fact that we just don't know how to deal with this. Like you guys in the documentary have all these clips from people in Washington saying you can't hack into these systems or you can't do this and you can't do that. And it's either blatant ignorance or it's lying. It's the same thing with the voting machine companies. So what is most frustrating when it comes to elected officials and also the people who are behind these companies for the voting machines? So first of all, uh, a lot of people who are elected officials, a lot of people who are elections, uh, local election supervisors, they are good people. They are trying to do their work. They are working hard. They just lack training, information, and resources. That's the situation in, in that area. Uh, and of course, there is the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is a lot of the election officials are elected themselves. So there are no job uh, interviews. There's no job requirement. Anyone who wins the election will get the job. Which means that now, since those people who get elected, many of them have no background in elections, who they are turning to? They are turning to the uh, private sector. Because there's two kinds of states there, top-down and bottom-up. In top-down state, the Secretary of State, who is the chief election official in the public's mind in most of the states, they have a lot to say how the counties run the elections. In bottom-up, the counties are very independent, and the Secretary of State's office have a very lose control, if not control at all, over what is happening there. So there's a new breed of companies which are working between the traditional vendors and the election jurisdictions. And those companies have no requirements of disclosure, no requirements to tell who they are, what they do, and, or, and no secular standards. Mm -hmm. Those companies are very often the people who are telling the local, the incoming new election supervisor, this is how we have been doing it. So when I'm, when I'm uh, advising Secretary of State almost every single time, the first advice is you have a very good laws. Enforce those. And it, the enforcing here doesn't mean that, they are, they, that there's an intentional, by the, the election official's point of view, intentional discard of the laws. The issue is that the, the incoming election official is turning to the service company who has service in the predecessor, and now that company is explaining how the law should be implemented or how the things has been. So all of a sudden the process is down on, on a grassroots level are greatly differing from what is what the law is and what the regulations are. And even to make the bad things worse, uh, one thing what we have learned a number of times when the Secretary of State is trying to find out what is happening in the, in the state, that person is, uh, is the, the secretary is then sending the questioner to the counties and county officials says, I don't know what this is and turns it to the company. So now it is the whole process is, is discarded. And just to give an idea, I was recently working for one secretary. It's a swing state, an important state secretary. And when we did the study, we found that that state has over 100 counties. We found that two of the counties do their own elections. Everybody else has been outsourced. And when we found what is actually happening down on the grassroots, uh, again, you have good laws. Enforce those. <laughs> There's a lot of different broken parts to it and a lot of inter interesting parts of this documentary. I mean, you guys literally bought voting machines off of eBay. How did you come up with that idea and what was that like for you guys? So... Yes, yeah, so the whole, the whole idea there was that uh, all kind of weird things are sold in eBay. And, and, um, and there had been a voting machine sold before, but they were sold in a shady way. And all of a sudden, when a massive amount of, of voting machines showed in eBay, well, that's a good idea, let's buy them. Well, first of all, the first rebuttal. Uh, which came from the voting machine vendors was to say, oh, this is illegal activity. There are few stolen voting machines being sold in eBay. 
and we will pursue this legally. But first of all, as we show in the movie, uh, there is over a thousand voting messages in this one vendor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when we started buying these, we actually bought not only from eBay, but also government surplus stores. So this actually, we, in one case, we literally took the van because the voting machines were so bulky. So the, the county was giving the voting machines for free. So with a $1, we got the purchase certificate so we can prove where they came from. Right. But the voting machines were for free if you just come and pick them up because the shipping would have been costing thousands of dollars. And that is also a voting machine still in use in over 20 states. So, of course, we took a van and picked them up. But this is really one thing what we, we, uh, we started realizing. There's other interesting part. If not only these voting machines are sold uh, by the vendors in eBay and whatnot to anyone who wants to buy, no questions asked. But also when we started the voting machine hacking village, uh, one of the rebuttals was that we are irresponsible because we are potentially letting foreign, foreign actors to learn how the voting machines work. Well, first of all, the voting machine vendors themselves send, sell the voting machines to uh, a number of different countries. Actually, one of the best selling models, their first customer was state of Mongolia between Russia and China. I'm absolutely certain there's nothing, nothing ever will be looked upon in state of, of Mongolia. <laughs> but again, the fact that these voting machines are sold to France, to, uh, to Mongolia, wherever, they are selling them themselves. But the other part is they are not actually, a lot of these voting machines are not U.S. origin. And I'm not only talking about the components being made in China or the voting machine being assembled in, in Philippines, but also the very brain of the machine, the programming. In many, very, many voting machines, that programming, no, either whole or in a large part, is coming from a foreign program code sources. And it seems to be the case that actually the voting machine vendors, generally speaking, either don't know or they refuse to tell the truth where the code actually comes from. Is there anything we can do to stop tampering in our elections come 2020 in November? Uh, 2020 is too close. Uh, you have to start, if you want to make a big change, you have to start about two years, three years before the election. Right now, uh, of course, everything what you can do has to be done. And so uh, that's one thing which is education is very important part, looking the processes, because you cannot anymore change the programming. You cannot any, anymore change that part. But there's a lot of way, things which are in the processes and how the voting machines are programmed for that specific elections, et cetera. And again, people who care, it's very important. If you are eligible to vote, vote. Vote all the way down the ballot because the money is down in the ballot. Ask for paper ballots. Uh, and if you really care, become a poll worker. Be eyes on the ground. See what, if there's something which happens. Educate, help the other poll workers. So all these small things add up. So be involved. Ari, thank you so much for your time. Really looking forward to having everybody watch the documentary. Thank you very much for having me.